Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for this week's video lecture. Today we're looking at Strayer's Chapter 11, Pastoral Peoples on the Global Stage, the Mongol Moment 1200 to 1500. Um, in the opening section, Strayer uh, sort of frames everything in the context of how history traditionally has been told from the perspective of agriculturalists. And in this chapter, he's going to look at uh, history from the perspective of pastoralists, and in particular, the Mongols. Um, but he starts in the first main section looking back and around and points out the long history of pastoral nomads. And you'll remember that pastoralism begins in the foundation era with the domestication of plants um, and the people who are moving around with these domesticated animals um, are sort of in contrast to the people who end up becoming uh, settled agriculturalists, eventually living in cities and building states and empires. So in the first uh, section here, he talks about the world of pastoral societies, how they lived. Uh, typically, pastoralists were less productive than settled agriculturalists, resulting in smaller populations that required larger expanses of land. They specialized in making a living off unproductive land. These grasslands could not sustain humans, but they could sustain their herds of animals. Thus, the pastoralists lived off the meat, milk, and blood rather than grains. With low population density and relatively simple social structures, these societies enjoyed much greater social equality than their settled neighbors. Women engaged in most of the same tasks as men in terms of raising the herd and riding. While they were a mobile population that lived off their animals, they still needed the products of settled societies. Thus, even though they might disdain the agriculturalists, they were frequently in, in contact with them and exchanged their animal products for the manufactured goods of the towns and cities. Without urban centers, it was very difficult to sustain a state system. A few charismatic individuals, such as Genghis Khan, could forge alliances, but the strength of the Union was dependent on wealth coming in and would fall apart when their economic fortunes turned. Before the Mongols, there were several important pastoralists. Uh, Strayer's going to mention several. There are several others that I will discuss uh, in the uh, podcast that we've already studied that you need to know. Um, the first of these, though, is the Zhang Nu, uh, led by a guy named Mo Dun. This leader united a diverse group of tribes from Manchuria and Central Asia. He engaged in revolutionary change of the military and forced the Han Chinese in the classical era, era to negotiate with them as equals. Another nomadic group we've looked at are the nomadic Arabs, the Bedouins, who made an alliance with urban-based merchants led by Muhammad and served as the main military power for the Prophet. They also helped to spread Islam as they moved about the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, yet another one from the post-classical period are the Turkic people from Central Asia originally. A variety of Turkic-speaking peoples came out of the steppes and threatened the settled agricultural empires. Soon aspects of Turkic, Turkic culture influenced the northern Chinese court. The Seljuk Turks fought off a series of wars with Byzantium, but it was the Ottoman Turks that finally overthrew the last vestige of Rome in 1453. The Ottomans then became a very urban society and culture. And yet another example from the post-classical period, in northwest Africa, the Berber people converted to Islam but were superficial in their practice. After 1039, Ibn Yasin, a scholar who returned from the Hajj, launched a reform campaign to make the practice of the faith more orthodox. Soon the movement became an expansionist state that moved into Spain and controlled much of present-day Morocco. Like other examples, the Almoravids became urbanized and enjoyed impressive art and architecture. Remember, too, there's a later um, Berber empire called the Almohads that we looked at um, in the chapter on Islam. In this map from your textbook, you can see how large the Xiongnu Confederacy is. This, of course, is during the Classical period. Um, remember, there's in Central Asia a confederacy. There are a lot of different ethnic groups that are uh, briefly united under the Xiongnu. But you can see how large that territory is and why that represents such a threat to the Han dynasty. 
Um, this is a map from the textbook as well of the Amoravids, the Berbers who create an empire in the um, western section of North Africa. Um, and if you remember, the, they were the ones that tried to create a link between the Mediterranean and the um, Sudanic states in West Africa. Okay, so these are societies, pastoral societies, that we've seen before in history, but of course the big star of the show are the Mongols, and the uh, leader is originally born as Temujin, and uh, we know him in history as Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan. A note on the spelling there. Strayer uses the spelling that you see on the screen right here. It's actually pronounced Genghis Khan. And while you will hear Genghis Khan and see it most often with the G, remember it's uh, there's different ways of saying it or spelling it, but the same uh, pronunciation. Despite uh, a, a, a poor terrible upbringing in which his father was murdered when he was a young child, his resourceful mother led the immediate family through a marginal existence. But as he won a series of battles and forged alliances based on loyalty and not kinship, Temujin steadily built up a powerful force. In this process, he gained a reputation for destroying his enemies but rewarding those loyal to him. He also incorporated warriors from defeated tribes into his army. Uh, in 1206, a tribal assembly made him the great leader and gave him the title of Genghis Khan, or Great Khan. So what we know him in the history is actually his title. His birth name was Temujin. Uh, to build more power and also to hold the Mongol alliance together, he started a series of expansionist wars that eventually conquered China and Central Asia. The empire was only checked in Eastern Europe, the Levant, and the jungles of Southeast Asia in the Sea of Japan. He set in motion the building of the world's largest land-based empire, and it was run by a population of, of actual Mongols that was less than one million people. I'm sorry, this map is the one that you will use to model your infographic off after he uh, dies, he divides part of his empire up to his sons and grandsons, of which he had many. Um, over time, though, those uh, split up in a process that's rather rem reminiscent of what happened to Alexander the Great after in his empire after he dies, um, such that it, it splits off into four uh, smaller empires, the Great Khanate, which is uh, run by his grandson Kublai Khan, we know as the Wan Dynasty in China, the Khanate of Jagadai, or Chagatai, you might see it spelled this way, um, Helugu is his grandson who is running the Il Khanate of Persia, and then we've got an unusual situation up here in uh, Russia, uh, the Kipchak Khanate, or the Golden Horde, is what the Russians called them, where there's not a an occupation. But we'll look at that more closely in a moment. So, uh, how do we explain, then, that this uh, pastoralist society ends up with the largest land-based empire in human history? First of all, like the Romans, but growing much bigger and faster, the Mongols created objective strategy and ideology as they expanded. They were only checked when they turned around in Eastern Europe, were defeated in the Levant and the jungles of Southeast Asia, or hit by typhoons when invading Japan, but they didn't really have a clear objective when they first started. They were kind of making it up as they went. The Mongols were lucky in that both the Chinese and Arab empires at the time were in a weak and divided condition when they attacked. They also succeeded by organizing a superior army with a clear command and control structure. The army faced severe discipline, including the death penalty for desertion, but loyalty was greatly rewarded. Genghis Khan had great charisma, eating and fighting with his troops, for example. The Mongol people also became very wealthy from the loot of the empire. This helps foster that expansionist um, idea that we see in empires throughout history. Uh, one of the things that makes the Mongols unique, though, is they made good use of conquered people who had skills, such as artisans, bureaucrats, and technicians. The Mongols themselves had very little experience running any sort of administrative bureaucracy, but what they did do well was um, 
hire or um, include the services of the conquered peoples that did know how to do that. When attacking or taking revenge against an insult, the Mongol army was a ruthless and engaged in huge massacres and the enslavement of women and children. This had a clear psychological impact on cities faced with a coming Mongol horde. Despite their ruthlessness in battle, the Mongols showed excellent administrative skills after the conquest and after they learned how to do so from the conquered people. With a system of riders for communication and well-organized taxation, the Mongol Empire had the resources and infrastructure to govern. Recognized the value of a vibrant economy, the Mongols ensured profit and safe conduct for merchants. It is in this time that we get the highest point of uh, trade on the Silk Roads, for example, um, where they're not trading so much as they're fostering the ability to trade, which in turn gives them a great deal of profit. Uh, with no interest in religious imperialism, the Mongols tolerated various religions and even improved the conditions of some minorities, such as Christians. Later, uh, several of the Mongol leaders will convert to Islam, but the tradition of religious tolerance is definitely there um, early on in its expansion. Okay, so as the uh, Mongol Empire expands, they're coming into contact with uh, well-established civilizations. And in this next section, Strayer is going to look at how that happens in three particular examples. And the first of these is how the Mongols uh, adapt and, uh, and then finally conquer in the face of uh, China. China was the main target of the Mongols, and in 1209, Genghis Khan launched an attack on this wealthy and prosperous region. After a series of campaigns lasting seven decades, the Mongols were victorious. While the Mongols were brutal and destructive in the north of China, they were much more accommodating in the south. The Mongols did adopt some aspects of Chinese statecraft in order to rule the region more effectively and withdraw as much wealth as possible. They went so far as to establish a Chinese-style dynasty. Kublai Khan, grandson of Chinggis Khan, listened to the counsel of his favorite wife, Chabi, and adopted policies that encouraged agricultural production in order to generate more wealth. The Mongols adopted some aspect of Chinese ancestor veneration and built roads, canals, and other forms of infrastructure to promote commerce. While the Mongols did try to accommodate their Chinese subjects, they were foreign occupiers who were, who were there to extract as much wealth as possible and were thus resented by the Chinese. Mongols disregarded the exam system and their reliance on foreigners, such as Muslims from Central Asia and the Middle East, to administer their empire irked many Chinese. The Mongol elite kept many of their traditional practices, such as sleeping in tents, even when in the capital. Factionalism among the Mongols, rising prices, and a series of natural disasters weakened their hold on power and allowed some space for rebels to begin challenging their authority. The Wan dynasty was overthrown in 1368, and the new Ming dynasty sought to eliminate the memory and all record of the Mongols. So another example can be seen in the uh, interactions with the Persians, the people of the Middle East, um, two brutal attacks brought down the Persian Empire, falling much faster than China did. These attacks were much more intense and devastating than the earlier assaults from Turkic invaders. They were also more psychologically devastating because unlike the Turks, the Mongols were not Muslim but pagan barbarians. Um, Helugu is the grandson of uh, Chinggis Khan, and he's the one who ends up administering much of the Khanate, the Il Khanate, actually, of Persia. Out of a lack of respect for agriculture, and because of the damage caused by the Mongols' herds, there was serious damage to the region's farmland. Important underground irrigation systems, the Khanate system, fell apart, leading to desertification of some areas in the region. The Persians had a much more significant impact on the Mongols than the Chinese did. The invaders quickly realized the importance of the pure Persian bureaucracy and used it for their own purposes. They also began to rebuild damaged cities and roads. 
When the dynasty fell in the 1330s, the Persians did not expel the Mongols, but rather assimilated them into their own Persian culture. And then a third example can be seen in Russia. Uh, brutal invasions uh, using technology such as catapults and battering rams that were gained from campaigns in China and Persia were used to invade the Kievan Rus with an impressive assault on a weak and disunited people. Um, the Kipchak uh, Khanate is what the Mongols called it. The Russian term uh, was the Golden Horde, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, and so you'll see both referenced um, in various sources. It's also worth noting that the word for Mongols that the Russians used were Tartars, uh, and so in some of the documents you may encounter, you'll see them referred to with that word as opposed to Mongols. While the invasion was impressive and devastated some era, areas, the Mongols chose not to occupy the relatively poor and isolated Rus. Instead, they settled nearby on the steppes and pastoral lands north of the Caspian and Black Seas. They put them within striking distance of the cities from which they extorted tribute. So they didn't directly occupy the area of the Kievan Rus they were right outside, always within striking distance, and always sort of a menacing potential force, uh, which would allow them to ensure that they were in charge. Some cities chose to resist and faced brutal retaliation. Kiev, for example, was razed, in other words, completely burned to the ground. Others collaborated and helped the Mongols collect tribute and taxes and wound up doing very well for themselves. Again, this is a common theme of their administration. You reward those who are loyal uh, greatly and you punish those who are not greatly. Moscow then rose as the core of a new Russian state that adopted Mongol weapons, diplomacy, taxation, court system, and a draft. The Russian Orthodox Church enjoyed Mongol tolerance and tax exemption and spread its reach deeper into the countryside. The Mongols actually made Moscow the uh, key city in the uh, Kievan Rus area. Well, the Rus area, Kiev is no longer the most important area. Um, and the Prince of Moscow, who was by Mongol decree the most powerful of the Russian princes was directly named by the Mongols. So again, they're not occupying um, Russia, but they do have direct control over it. Okay, so the, now that they've got this giant territory, even though it's divided up into smaller areas, uh, what we now see is the development of a Eurasian network, a large um, network that is uh, initially spurned on by economic concerns. While the Mongols did not make anything or engage in trade themselves, they did promote production and commerce in the regions they controlled, providing tax breaks for merchants and sometimes paying high taxes to attract commerce to their cities. The more commerce, the wealthier they got, even if they were not themselves uh, directly participating in it. The most important contribution was an unprecedented security on the Silk Roads. This allowed for a dramatic increase in trade throughout Central Asia, with many individuals making the entire journey from west to east and back. Marco Polo was the most famous, but many others used guidebooks on their trips. So this is um, after the fall of the Han and Roman empires. The Silk Roads sort of fall into an era of disrepair. It starts to recuperate um, during the Tang Dynasty and uh, the Abbasids in the Middle East. But under uh, Mongol protection, um, there's pretty much unlimited uh, movement within the Silk Roads because no one's going to do anything that's going to upset the Mongols. The Mongol trade circuit then connected to other trade networks throughout the rest of Asia, the Indian Ocean, the Middle East, West Africa, East Africa, and even Europe. Uh, and in this way, what we end up getting in this period is a truly um, Afro-Eurasian trade network that is uh, largely controlled by the Mongols. Now, in addition to economic trade, there's also diplomacy that is spreading throughout this giant network. Um, when the Mongols made their way into Eastern Europe in a 1241 to 1242 campaign, they seemed poised to take the region. 
However, the death of Great Khan Ogadai, who was uh, one, I think he was the oldest son of uh, Genghis Khan, required the Mongol leaders to return home. Aware of the threat of the, the Mongols posed now, European kings and the Pope sent emissaries east to negotiate with the Mongols. So diplomatic trade uh, was um, initiated by the Europeans because they realized, perhaps because they had the memory of the Huns from the classical era, that they were in big trouble if they did not forge alliances. These missions provided the previously isolated Europeans with the wealth of knowledge about the rest of the world. So when they send their diplomats out to Mongolia, they, the Europeans are aware, finally, of how much more there is to the world than the little area that they had previously occupied. Uh, as these two great empires were part of the larger Mongol system, communications between the uh, Chinese and Persian areas increased. Thus, the Mongols created an unprecedented level of international communication. In this map from your textbook, um, you can see these different um, sort of regional trade systems that are now interlocking. And so... Um, Areas that we haven't seen before, um, or maybe were not that big of a deal, are now all interlocked and all plugged in, such that by the end of the post-classical era, we genuinely have a uh, complete um, Afro-Eurasian trade network that is essentially linking the entire supercontinent. You'll also notice uh, something we'll get into, which is the spread of other perhaps not so positive things uh, along these trade routes. Um, in addition to money and diplomacy, of course, culture spreads over trade routes. We've seen this example repeatedly. Um, the Mongols forced some people, such as artisans, engineers, and bureaucrats, to move from one place to another where their skills were needed. However, Others moved freely as part of religious travel tolerated by the Mongols or as part of commercial activity encouraged by them. Technology, especially from China, moved freely and quickly within the Mongol domain, as did medical knowledge. Various crops were carried from one region to another. Europe gains the most. Uh, Europe, which had been poor, backwards, and isolated relative to the rest of the world, uh, it gains the most from these ex exchanges, even though it has the least to offer. Um, this may have set Europe on the path toward expansion. Uh, technologies that we will see later on that are crucial for the uh, maritime expansion of European civilization, um, weapons technology, uh, all these things that we associate with the rise of the West are actually introduced uh, during this time into Europe. As I mentioned before, not everything is positive in these exchanges. Clearly, disease is, is something that we've seen before spreading over trade networks. Um, the most uh, notorious example in world history is the bubonic plague, which is a mutation of the Yersinia pestis, um, which is spread very, very quickly, and it killed large numbers in areas of dense population. The death spread during the... It, uh, during the increase of trade from fleas that lived on rats. Um, and you can see the dates in when the uh, plague hits various parts of the world here. It starts in China, then follows world trades that savage cities all across Afro-Eurasia. Um, by some estimates, uh, about 50% of the European population dies from plague at this time. In a pre-scientific era of high religiosity, particularly in Europe, some of the Christian and Islamic worlds saw it as the end of days. This was genuinely seen by a large percentage of people as a sign of the end of the world, and it uh, sparks all sorts of um, religious fervor in various areas. With so many dead in Europe in particular, there were labor shortages that provide new opportunities for skilled workers, women, and peasants. 
This mass death set in motion several important social changes. There was also a rise in labor-saving devices spurring new technological innovations in Europe. This is an idea we'll come back to later as several people see this as a factor in the rise of capitalism in the next uh, early modern late agrarian uh, period because there's just so few people to work that the laborers now have a, um, a particular advantage. The biggest victim of the Black Death, however, was the Mongol Empire itself. With trade disrupted, the economic heart of the empire failed. Mongol wealth decreased and rebellions increased. So the expansionist ideology of empire, which we've talked about particularly in the classical era, in the post-classical era when the Mongols could no longer extract the loot that has made them so wealthy, um, the 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 internal uh, mechanics of the empire start to uh, fade and that's what ends up leading in part to their demise. So in the reflections era um, Strayer raises some very interesting questions which he typically does about how we view pastoral peoples in general and Mongols in particular. Um, first of all he notes that most histories have a very dim view of nomadic people only noting when they threatened a more advanced society. This idea that, that traditionally history is written from the perspective of agriculturalists. Uh, part of the problem is that historians use written sources from settled areas that were threatened by the nomadic people. People living in cities and states have writing and so they're documenting what's going on. Typically uh, pastoral nomads do not have writing and so if we go back to study the past we have the sources from those who were writing who are the ones that are threatened by the nomads. Another problem is that most nomadic people were taken over eventually by settled societies. The nomads lost and the winners wrote the history often with a disdainful attitude for those that were different. Recently, revisionist historians have taken a new look at the nomadic people and stressed their achievements and their role in creating a world system. This is particularly true in the AP World Course where the impact the Mongols had on creating an Afro-Eurasian network um, is, is a relatively new perspective in the history of world history itself. Uh, looking back at the horrors of the 20th century, uh, two world wars, a cold war, all sorts of smaller regional wars, um, causes us to put the violence of the Mongols in perspective. Clearly, they were not the only brutal people in world history. Um, when we consider our own so-called civilized brutality, uh, particularly in the 20th century, it's rather difficult to look back on this period with some sort of morally superior attitude about the brutality of the Mongols. Um, we're going to actually pick this up in class, this idea of were the Mongols um, in general and Genghis Khan in particular, were they more positive or negative influences on uh, world history and the spread of civilization. This is something we'll get to further in class this week. Um, thank you for joining me for the video lecture, and I'll see you in class.